Welcome to the Same Snob Podcast. All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Scene Snob Interviews. I'm, of course, your host, Mick Manhattan, and I am joined today by Josh Schubart. And we're here to talk about his new series and so much more, especially all the cool stuff that he has behind him that <laughs> I'm admiring right now. Uh, Josh, welcome to the show, man. Hey, man, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me on, dude. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, first and foremost, we were kind of just talking about it. You're out in Long Island. I am. Um, you know, that... I'm up from that area as well, so like it's a whole different beast. Um, is that where you grew up? Yeah, so I grew up on Long Island um, for the most part. I like moved around a lot when I was a kid, um, hopping back and forth between uh, family's houses and friends' houses till I end ended up where I ultimately um, spent most of my childhood, which which was in. I slip New York out on Long Island. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you've adopted it well, the New York lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, moving a lot. And, but, but now I like have my, my, my own house and I haven't moved in a very long time and it's fantastic. It is nice too. Once you get like, like that place you live, you're like, I, I never want to move again. Yeah. I don't want to go <laughs> anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we're kind of, before we get into the show, which, um, you know, I have not had a chance to see or anything yet, and I, I'm very much looking forward to it. Cool. Uh, I want you to tell me, uh, tell me more about it, but let's talk about you a little bit. So, okay. you know, we, you know, we were kind of discussing your childhood growing up and, and such, but I, I want to talk about your career and how it led you into that, like what you're doing now. Okay, sure. Right. So, uh, you know, filmmaking, acting and such, like how did, how did that, how did you move towards that in, in your life? Well, so, so I, all of my roles that I've mostly ever played and when you're like a larger dude, cause I'm a larger dude, um, you get roles that are like really bad, really, really funny, or you're really bad and also funny. And there's really no in between so what kind of got me into making my own shit is that can i curse on this sorry yeah go for it all right cool um Whatever is, is um i wanted to play roles where i could be me where i could be a complete human being um and i because in in entertainment you don't see guys like me going through things that everyone else goes through mm -hmm we're we're like either being laughed at or we're you know or we're like punching you in the face and i really wanted to make things that showed larger guys could cry and could hug you and can have kids and get married and have families and go go through ter terrible loss and have amazing fun and everything in between because i know i haven't really seen that and if i have then that guy is turned into something else. Like, like, you know, like Chris Pratt, for example, it's super cool that like he's in the Marvel universe and, and Jurassic Park and all that awesome shit. But he was just like a normal dude that was great. And he went through all that stuff and like all the time. And then they, and then he got turned into this like carbon cut out, like, turbo jacked rip dude that's that's like now in everything and the, and then he was allowed to be a human being right yeah. so um so that's why i got into filmmaking <laughs> i love that man because i'm a big guy too so you know like and you don't and one of the things that really bugged me about the whole chris pratt thing not him uh you know i understand and like you know he got picked for a role and he went at it and i give him a lot of credit for everything he did um it's the if you remember like how big he was they never really played that joke in perks and rep that he was a big guy right then he loses the weight like you know just kind of reiterate like what you're saying like then he loses the weight but then if you remember in like end game he like was just he wasn't fat for lack of a better term by any means in that movie you could just tell he put on maybe a few more pounds and they were making fat jokes well, but yeah, like, right i'm like Nobody said anything about him for years when he was a big guy. 
and now he puts on a few more pounds in between movies, and this is like a butt of a joke in a movie. I'm like, ah. I was like, and right. you got fat audiences watching this. <laughs> Maybe you need and, to like I want to work with Marvel very much, as you can yeah. tell by by my walls. Like I will, I really want to be in the new Fantastic Four because I want to play Ben Grimm. I would, I feel like I would be a great, I would be great at that. Um, and I'll work out as much as the fuck I need to, but but like, um, the bottom line is that like, I can't shrink down to some like Tom Cruise size. That's I've never been. I'm I'm big man. I got big bones. I'm tall as hell. And like, and no matter what, I'll, that's what I'll be representing, and that's what I want to be representing. And and I do agree with you. I don't like fat shaming in anything. It's not cool. You have no idea why a person looks look looks the way that they do. And even if there is a reason that's like not not like medical, like fuck you. You don't know what the fuck's going on with anybody. Like chill. Just let people live their lives. And if they're happy, shut the fuck up. Yeah, and I mean, that, I'm sure the same for you. It goes in the other spectrum too. Like you know people who work out and, are, you know, are into it. So I'm not shaming them either. Like, good for them. Like, right. You know, anybody who wants, however you want to look, if you work towards it, that's what I respect. Body shaming sucks no matter who is being shamed and for what reason. No one should. And there's no reason for it on either end of the fucking spectrum at all. I love that. Yeah, you know, that, that's, I'm going to take that sound bite. You, you should. You should. Gosh, does. Do yes. Yeah. I love it, man. <laughs> Real quick, again, I do want to talk about after because, uh, you know, reading up on it and such and, and, and seeing, like, you know, it sounds like such an incredibly touching tale. Well, let's actually, let's get into it. I want to I want to talk about it. So, All right. I mean, we, we can talk about whatever you want for as long as you want. I don't care, man. I am here for you. So let's. Oh, dude, man. Don't, don't worry. We're going to be talking about some comic books. <laughs> We're going to be talking about that geek stuff. Nice. Um, but I do want to. I want to hear more about it after, and I want the, I want people watching and listening to to hear about it as well. Sure. Because you know, right now, like there seems to have been sort of a. Um, I don't want to say a resurgence because you don't really, you've never really seen it before. Like, but like a, you know, a lot of shows coming out where they deal with like, uh, especially uh, a male dealing with the loss of like his wife. Mm. And I'll be in, becoming a widower, and you. This is kind of what that show is about, but it's about like it, what it seems from everything I've read is like um, self improvement. You know, trying to deal with that grief and such. Um, more have I seen on TV where it's a comedic take. Sure. Is after a comedic take, or is it more dramatic? So it's a dramedy. So it's a mixture of both. So I made after for. A multitude of reasons. One of them is what we were talking about earlier about why I got into making my my own work is because I want to show a person like like me going through all that stuff. But I'm a huge advocate for mental health, especially men's mental health. Um, I I guess like this ties into my back life or whatever. But um, my biological mother was bipolar, and she was horribly addicted uh and and she and she was an addict like a very bad bad one and she loved me very very much but unfortunately she couldn't take care of me and her bipolar was never managed in the way that it was supposed to through whatever reasons it was the 80s and the 90s and mental health wasn't spoken about in that way like like we're kind of talking about it now um and I've had to handle my own issues with with mental health and me wanting to leave the earth and all this stuff. Um, but a person going through grief, going through loss, going through anything like that, it's heart heartbreaking and crazy and insane. But it but it can also be absurdly hilarious because of the things that you're responding to you're not supposed to respond to things in that way and to, and and to other folks it can seem funny and comedy is a good way in to under to to understanding um so it's i would say it's pretty half and half after um just but it's not and there is some like um 
comedy that's comedy, but it's not like over the top and it's meant to be balanced and messy and weird and icky and fun just just like life is all the time. Um, and anyway, so after is about <laughs> um, a guy who loses his wife and then has to move back home and he's not sure what's going on and he reconnects with his best friend and his parents and they're trying to get him back out into the world, trying to meet people in a romantic way. And it's been about a year since his wife passed and he lost his job. He's horribly depressed and he's on his way home. And we constantly go back and forth from what's happening him to him now. And then whatever's happening to him, we have a look back to what it was like with his wife and uh, then how that horrifies him and also helps him move into the future in a new, more positive way, not in a perfect way, because that's not real and that's not what happens to anyone, but especially not with people that are handling mental health, but in a better way, in a new way, in a hopeful way. And that's what I want people to take away from after is hope that no matter what you are feeling, no matter what you are dealing with, no matter what's happening to you in your life, hope is there and it, it's, it will always be there and you can move towards hope. Nice. And that's, and so, I mean, that's an incredibly important message. Um, and, you know, we're big advocates for mental health here on, because this is a, you know, just kind of give you a background on scene snobs. Like we're a network with like 30 shows. Oh know, yeah. Podcasts, things like that. So, um, and we're a number of us deal with like mental health and, and ending stigmas and things like that. So, you know, because it's important, like you said, it's 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 time. You know, it, it's we're at that point. Especially for men, especially for men. Yeah. Oh, I understand. Agree. Like I, yeah. I, mean, I grew up in a John Wayne household. Mm. So growing up in that sense, like, and you know, <laughs> weirdly enough, telling my brother this the other day because they're legalizing marijuana in uh, in Virginia. And I'm telling him, like, man, I don't know. I've never really done it before, you know, because I grew up with cops and stuff like that. I was like, I follow the law. And I was like, but they're legalizing. And I was like, I might jump into this and have some fun. And he's a cop, and he's just like, yo, you have fun with that. And I'm like, you know what nobody ever said was, yeah, I'm on my fourth the, I'm on my fourth wife because of uh, all the weed that I do. Yeah, I'm like, right. no. No, one ever, no one's ever said that. And I'm always trying to point it out to him. I was like, man, stop the John Wayne stuff. Like, <laughs> it's not that, it's, you know, like, let's just, you know, start ending this stuff. And, like, we get into conversations like that, him and all the friends and stuff. And I'm like, men need to just realize the world is changing for the better, you know. And if we can accept the things, like, we, we, you know, and go forward, we can improve ourselves. Yo, man, I love hearing that out of your mouth. That's fantastic. Like, just... And I love that people that hear you and watch you, that's that's your message. It's so so fucking important, man. Like, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, man. You know, and I give a lot of credit to, from like, not even that my perspectives have changed. I've always been pretty, like, open and try to be progressive. But I have two sons. And I'm like, I don't want them to grow up in a John Wayne household. And, right. You know, that's not to dis besmirch John Wayne, even though, I mean, <laughs> but like, you know, it, it's more like, I just don't, I don't want to be like, you have to be a man's man. Be like, nah, go out and do what you want to do. You want to sing, you want to dance, have fun. What you know, I love fun. about this is like, we're challenging now what it means to be masculine, right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And it turn, turns out it means everything. It means everything and every emotion and just, just being who you are is, fucking masculine no one can no one can coin what that means right um, and i think that's 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 great now especially it's needed just so that people don't turn into like t -t -t toxicity machines and fuck up their lives there's no reason for it anymore none and it's yeah it's so closed minded in my opinion um you know, if I'm if I were like that, if I if I kept just saying like this is what a man should be, there were so many friends, good friendships that I have 
that would have never come to fruition being that way. Sure. And I try to tell people, I'm like, I, you know, keeping your door open and being open about things, that's a lot of people in like that. You're just going to like, I mean, you get good, you get bad as well, but far more good. Sure. And far, far more, uh, is, is way far, uh, way more fun doing that. You know, I you totally really agree with you, man. I, I would not have, 90% of the friends that I have, if I kept with, with the ideals that I had when I was, you know, in my early teens. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this too. Cause I feel like guys, you know, we seem about the same age. So like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm 39. I don't know. Uh, 35. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, we're, we're around the same age. And yeah. so you, you understand the reason I say this, what it was like to grow up and like be condemned for liking comic books, liking, like I like horror movies, stuff like that. Like being, being, being an outcast, man. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we grew up in a time where like you got beat up for it and really picked on it. And, and like, it was horrible. Like people used to take my shoes and hurl them on the roof of the school. And, and, and they knew that, that I didn't have any money. And that was my only pair of shoes. They knew. And they would still throw them on the fucking roof because I was the nerd weirdo who had a weird, weird life. And I was also friends with all the other weirdo, you, you know, like we all hung out together because we were considered weird. It was like nerds, punks, people that were that are gay, trans, like we we were all in the same group during that time time period because there was nowhere else to go. So we so we just like mashed up together and we're just like we gotta like make sure no one takes our fucking shoes today <laughs> yeah oh yeah and and definitely like, and it, it just that was always a i mean I'm, I'm so glad i grew up in that community um you know thinking back on it at the time you're kind of like i can't stop the torture but you know i think it attributes to like why we are who we are now and why we are more accepting because we were the outcast so it's like you see another outcast you're like no 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 come here i got you um, and that's so important. Uh, yeah, that's just an important attribute to have, you know, as a human being. And I, it's so nice to see younger generation now just be that way. Well, Basically. nerd, being a nerd and nerd c culture, I'm so I'm so happy, and I'm so mad that it's part of the mainstream now. <laughs> um, but I would say that I'm mostly I'm mostly happy. I'm mad for like m me being a little bitter about the fact that my life was terrible because I liked it. But like comics and like horror films and things like that have always been on the cutting edge of shit that we needed to talk about, but we couldn't in the quote unquote like normal life or the normal media or the normal TV shows, right? Like just look at, just look at Wolverine, right? fucking webcam just just forget wolverine like wolverine was talking about ptsd before it was even brought up oh. on like a normal tv show ever like oh. i've i've seen P ptsd coming up maybe like in the past 10 years right and how old is wolverine like 50 60 years old That's 60s. yeah yeah it's 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 truly amazing i mean yeah, I mean, comic books were just always way ahead of their time dealing with things. And that was, I think, going forward with that, too, and seeing as we grew up, like, the generations come up through comic books and realize this, like, our parents didn't realize this because their comics didn't deal with that. Right. You know, it was really Marvel that stepped up at first and was like, we're going to give them problems and you're going to learn about them. Yeah. You know, Spider-Man, right, having a homosexual friend. In the seventies, like right. that was huge, um, and, and dealing with those those uh, those topics. So, and horror movies, like you said too, like were doing the same thing. They were dealing with a lot of topics, and they were normalizing in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were cliches and there were tropes um, for all different types of uh, you know um, groups that were being represented, but. I, I attribute that to the times that the movies were made. Um, but at least they were saying, like, these people exist, and right. we need to make them characters in our movies. not And not just shine a light on them and say, he's a homosexual. You right. know? Like, no, he's a homosexual, but he's a character in a movie. Like, 
or then you get something like a John Hughes movie who, where the homos and I love John Hughes movies. Don't get me wrong, but like the homosexual character has a light shined on them, and you know that's what they're. You know, I see what he was trying to do in his movies, but it wasn't normalized. Sure, you know. So, and that's what I love about movies today is like you can go watch anything and it's more normalized. It's it's you're not you're not pushing them, you know, these characters down my throat saying you have to understand that these people exist anymore because we're accepting that so many different uh, groups exist and, right. you know, have been pushed aside for so long. You know, Even and, one of my, like all my favorite movie of all time is the birdcage with, oh my God. right. My wife and I were just talking about this yesterday. <laughs> Even that movie, which was all about people being gay and men being in love, they still, they never got to kiss in the movie. That was never shown. They, you know, and there was a lot of stuff that was just okay because of the time period that, like, if that was made now, they would be like, we're fucking gay. You can go fuck yourself. I don't care who this person is, right? Yeah. Um, but that movie, when it was made at that time with those people, what what they were highlighting and what it did for the general dis discourse of our country with that sp specific topic with those two actors in that film holy shit right and it wasn't even like and like robin williams wasn't considered brave like it used to be like oh you're playing gay that's so brave of you what a great character thing for you like it wasn't like that and it was great it was like he's just he's just a gay guy in this movie and it's normal and he's and he's with this guy and he loves this this guy and his housekeeper is a guy and he's gay and he's but you know like and i was like yeah. and i loved it and i it's my favorite movie since i was young and i've watched it well over 200 times hey and that's a movie worth it because it's just so good. And I think uh, a lot of, and I think we could say this about a lot of movies, like why good sci-fi is good sci-fi or where good horror is good horror is because when you're not, again, showing awareness at the story or showing awareness of like things in the story, elements in the story, and you're just telling the story, it makes for such a better movie. Like the birdcage, like you said, it's not about this gay guy, being married to this gay guy and running a nightclub. It's about these parents trying to do something for their son. Right. And they, now, is it flamboyant? Is it, you know, do they live up to cliches and things? Yes. But they're also showing you how asinine it is for you to think that. Right. In the movie. But they're just telling the story. Ron Williams, like you said, Ron Williams didn't sign on to play this gay guy. He signed on to play this part. Right. And he played it flawlessly. He was great. Yeah, everybody did, and that's why it's such a great movie. Is that what I just loved about it the most? I mean, other than it being incredible, but there were. It was one of the first movies that I saw, or the first any things that I saw, where being gay didn't mean one specific thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like there were all types of people, and they were all gay. Yeah. Or they were all whatever they were. And everyone was totally different in the way that they acted, the way that they were as people. And I had never seen that before, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I had only seen gay gay people as like hyperly over the top. And, you know, and even my gay f f friends who, who were in the cl 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 closet had never seen like that before and it was it was huge for them and i i, I love i just love the movie <laughs> yeah. oh yeah 100 yeah, percent. and i you know i and it, it, it's i think because again at that time in the 90s we were outcasts yeah you know anytime you saw people being treated different and that's what i love about us like guys like us and, and girls too and you know so many um being outcast at that time because we loved a certain thing or we did, you know, we act certain ways or whatever, or we were going through things in a certain way, you know, um, you, you never shunned other people. You never said like, 
if you saw an outcast, you weren't like, I can't deal with your problems. Like you're like, no, go, no, let me help yeah. you. no. Um, let me hear them. Yeah. And weirdly enough, today you have the world of the internet where it's like everybody's shunning everybody, but it's like, uh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like they're trying to make outcasts and it's like, what do we fight for? <laughs> I, dude, I know, I know, I know. But, uh, yeah, I, I think entertainment is so, is so important, like you, like with your show after and such, it, shining a light on so many things like mental health and especially mental health. That is like the thing right now that like it's so so much more normalized than it ever ever was and we, we can still do better there. we have to it yeah. will the amount of positive change that it will bring about mm -hmm. it just with children and with entire families with how we handle law enforcement how we handle hospitalizations how we literally handle every as aspect of our country, if mental health is really taken into account and we really take a look at it and we really understand it, so much can change for the better. Yeah, and, and that's again why I'm so happy with younger generations today. Um, they don't seem to care about anyone, like, like which is cool. Like They're just like, oh, you're trans, gay, you've got bi bipolar, your multiple personality, you're schizophrenic. Okay, whatever. We just don't don't like how you wear your pants. And it's like, yeah. cool, whatever, <laughs> fine. Yeah, it cool. is fair. It's a lot of that stuff like today. It's just, but I mean, like even like the cancellations and stuff like that, like so many people talk about cancel culture and how it goes. And for me, some of the stuff where people are getting canceled, I'm like, could it be a, is it, does it seem extreme? Like, and I'm talking about like if, if a 27 year old made a tweet when they were 14, I'm like, all right, when, below 18, you got to start being for, more forgiving because you don't understand how stupid kids are, you know? And I say that as a general sense, general statement, as in like, we're all young. We're all like, a, we're all aspiring to be something when we're a teenager and figure out who we are. And right. nobody really knows. And a lot of times people say stupid things as teenagers or, or younger um, because of, A, influence of whoever they're around. Uh, B, because they just don't know what's funny or not at the sure. time. Mm -hmm. And if they think they're making some people laugh, they're going to go for it because that's what teenagers do. But when you're 27 and somebody's like shines a light on this Thing you did like 10 15 years before and you're like i haven't been that guy in so long or i haven't been that woman in so you know so long like cut me some slack you know what i mean i i agree with you i agree with most of what yes yes absolutely. teenagers absolutely. And, and again yeah. that's teenagers like if a 40 year old right. has a something shined on them when they were 25 it's like you should have known better i i don't like cancel culture term I want it to be called a, um, a, a accountability culture. That's a good one, yeah. Um, because cancel culture it has 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 become this term, this like hot term, so that people just like throw away whatever the fuck is going on with, mm -hmm. like like even if it's really bad, they're like, oh, cancel culture, it's b bullshit. It's like, no, like we need to take a look at things as they come up and also take into account as you were kind of saying like how has this person's change been and their growth as a human being right yeah. if if there's been change and if there's been really positive growth fuck it right like yeah. they've 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 already learned leave them alone right <laughs> right which is what you were actually saying so yeah. I just don't like the the whole idea of cancel culture and what that term like it comes it's very loaded now like it comes with a whole other bag of shit to it because people don't when like people say like I don't want to be canceled like it's not like why would you be canceled then like like 
True. If you don't want to be canceled, what'd you do? You rapist? Because if you are, then you need to get the fuck out of here. Like nobody wants yeah. you on anymore. But yeah, I mean, you got to serve some time. Like you know, you do something, and and not to say like maybe your star shouldn't be a star if you've done this horrific thing and hit it. You know what I mean? Like, and that's that's something I've always told people, especially like you know, you can check my DMs because there's no skeletons in those closets. You know, but how many of you can say that? I and, can't guarantee that I didn't make a post when I was in high school where I didn't use offensive language that was n like n normalized at 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 the time. I yeah. can't. Um, but I can promise you that I don't use that now. I learn as hard and as fast as I can, and I fail constantly, but. God damn it, I'm trying as hard as I fucking can. <laughs> and that's see, that's the key. So that does like like I said, when it comes to teenagers, I, I just have like I wanna I wanna take care of kids. I, I want the kids to be safe. Sure. Especially like you know, being a father, like and the more I see, it's like we have to be more forgiving. They have to learn accountability, but not on the internet. Um, it doesn't have to be the court of public opinion when it comes to kids. And that nothing then it's kind of like juvenile records. It's like it should not haunt you into your life where you lose your job at 31 because you said something 15, 20 years before as a child. I don't um, disagree with you at all. Um, and that yeah. that's like where my biggest, like I do believe in accountability and I believe everybody should be held accountable in a way that suits the crime, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, but at the same time too, like there has to be checks and balances on both sides and, the court of public opinion, there's not really. Right. And it's like, where do we, where do we come into play where we forgive, you know, like, you know, okay, you did this. Why did you do this? What were you thinking when you did like have conversations? I think things need to open up, but we have such a power structure between the young generations wanting to say you're older. And it's even like, we're like in the middle of it in a weird way. Like yeah. our, our generation, like I'm talking about like our parents and older have been running things a certain way for so long. And the younger generation's like, no, we're not putting up with this anymore and how you did things. Right. So like they're going back and forth and the only power that they have right now, the younger generation is like, we can go back and hold you accountable for all that you did. And that's why I'm like, it needs to happen this way right now. It just needs to be this way right now so we can get a power structure in there that works for everybody, you know, and it ain't going to happen with no term limits. It ain't going to happen with like these older generations, like sure. Wayne attitude, you know, yeah. still in power. I will say that. Um, and it was this, this way with like civil rights and, W w women's rights and gay gay rights and basically anything that needed to have a platform and a voice that was very loud and very there in order to make some kind of change possible like with me too and with everything that has come out with with that and everything else that is being attributed to like like i said cancel culture mm -hmm. Sometimes, and most of the time, things like this need to be taken to a, to a place where it's, like, bothering folks. Yeah. Like, just so that it becomes part of public conversation. It becomes a part of our, like, collective ideas that we can begin to, like, understand. Like, when, when me, me Too happened, like and happens now and 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 is ha happening now mm -hmm. you know i've never raped anyone right but it got me in like a spiral in my mind just about being a man just just about my own power d d dynamic mm -hmm. in 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 life like what have i done in the past could this have been this like just mm -hmm. it had me question and go through things that I may not have even thought about before, right? Be yeah. so and I'm you know, whatever I'm 
you you call me liberal or whatever, and I like oh, no. whatever, but like I it got me to a place that I never thought that I would be in my own head, and I'm extremely progressive or that's 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 how how I feel that I am. And it made me think a lot and it and and it helped me change things about me that I didn't know were in there. So and 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 I wouldn't have known otherwise. Yeah, I, and it, it's more and more. It, it's great that you say that um, because you know not many are doing that. It, weirdly enough, you would think with today's world, like more and more, would, but a lot of people don't go back and, and think and say, "Well, what have I done? You know, have yeah. I done something that like may may seem this way or made a joke or something?" And like I've even like with my wife, like we've been married seven years going on seven years and even the world was a different place seven years ago mm-hmm. how you talk to people and like make jokes and certain things and i'm like you know I, I remember having a conversation with her maybe about a year or so ago and just saying like you know what do you think like just being together as long as we have like what have i said or what have you done or like you know kind of go back and forth that maybe offended each other or how it work and just to have like a, a good conversation open up dialogue and she was, I don't even remember the joke. And she was just like, yeah, you made a joke about this one time when we were dating. And yeah. it rubbed me the wrong way. And I was like, well, why did it? Because like when she repeated it to me, I was like, well, why did it rub you the wrong way? Because I, I don't see an issue with it. And she was like, well, this is why as a woman. And it helped me to kind of realize like, yeah, I mean, it's such a different experience between even just being a man and a woman. I was like, I've never thought of it. I've never thought of women feeling that way. Right. And it made me kind of go on a, I don't want to say like a huge journey or anything, but like, you know, I talked to my mother, I talked to other women in my life and I'm like, what have you been through? You know, like what I'm trying to understand better based off of like what my wife had told me. Um, And I want to know like, what have you been through? What are your experiences just in the workplace of overhearing people talk? you know, um, like, or make jokes or something. What's that like for you? And it really opened my eyes to even how like, um, different races, different, uh, genders, um, all take in information or take not information, but take in how, what people say. And I used to be, all right, well, I don't think in the name of comedy, should everything be on the table? No, but I was like, we should be more forgiving. And then it started realizing I'm like, no, I was like, if somebody's offended, yes, it's easy to say you're offended if you know you're the butt of a joke. But like, if somebody's really offended by something you say, you should at least take it into account. Now, I'm not saying you have to stop making the joke, but maybe change the way you do the joke. Sure, you know. So it really like, or even the way, and, and you know, I'm talking about the comedic side, but like, even the way you talk in the office or you talk about people, or you talk about this, like. I was never really a locker room type of guy talk like as, as people yeah, and I'm using that yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm not saying like, I haven't seen a beautiful woman and I've mentioned it, you know what I mean? I, yes. Yeah. But I wasn't the guy who was just like, Oh man, I'm going after her, you know, like, you know, just, but I do know many who were and I'm like, yeah, well, I get why you sitting somewhere and get why a woman would feel that way now, you know, right. Feel and I'm glad that in society, it seems more and more people are are becoming more understanding, especially men. Me too. Um, Especially white men. Let's be real. Like we're both white guys, and we're you know you seem um, very open, very progressive to to and caring about people's feelings. So that's a great thing. You know, so and again, going all the way back to like what I was saying growing up in a John Wayne household, that really wasn't how you were just like, I think how I think, and that's how I think. No, yeah. we're we're being well, more open now. The the amount of people that helped me throughout my my life, they all didn't look like me. Um mm-hmm. and or they 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 weren't like 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 me at all. And the people that helped helped me the most in my my life were black. Um and they gave me the best advice and they gave me the most helping hands. And um, uh, my closest friends and my 
greatest allies have been gay or trans or, you know, um, I've, you know, I protest with everyone that I can. I have flags on my house that make my neighbors very mad and they mail me shit in the mail. That's very scary. But um, you got to fight for what you want your area and your country to be. Like, what are the ideals that you want to see here? I strongly believe in our country. I love America very much. I don't love it for nationalism or for blind patriotism. I love our country for what it has the potential to be. And like that. that is a thing that we have always tried to do as, as a nation is to be better, is to be a better version of what came before. And recently that has been lost and we need to get back to a place. And we seem to be like trying to get to a new place in our country, in our world. Mm -hmm. and we fucking need to, because what the past, how, however long and the division and the schisms and the breaking of unity that it appeared that we had, Maybe we didn't. Maybe I was very na naive and I was very, very optimistic and I still am. But we have to be together. We have to be united. If if we are not, if we are not all in the same boat, then we're just going to sink, to use a yeah. dumb analogy from 100 years ago. But it, work, <laughs> um, it works, honestly. Like, it's still, like, that's why, you know, Sayings like that, phrases like that, are yeah. they mean the, something? The only thing that legitimately kept me alive was change, growth, trying, trying to move forward. Mm -hmm. If you are not constantly trying to be better, to be different, to be more incredible, you die. Yeah, Met, like metaphorically and also physically. So. I don't know. We must always search for excellence. I don't know if that sounds extremely pretentious, but that's kind of how I try to live life is always trying to be better, always trying to grasp for a thing that's just out of my reach. Yeah. And, you know, it, I'm, I'm optimistic. Like a lot of people seem like, especially in most recent years have been like losing hope. And I'm like, I was like, yeah, this was a setback, a huge setback and a very divisive setback in this country. But it it made some loud voices. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like we needed some loud voices to come out and be like, nope. And maybe in my lifetime, I won't see all the changes I'd like to see. Sure. For, for a better place. But I, I'm not one of those who's just like, you know, ah, uh, they they're not gonna do it. You know, it's it, it's or you know, it's they're they're crazy. I'm like, no, nah, younger generation, step up. Do you think? Because it hasn't been working for I don't know how long. You know, power structure meaning. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead, do your thing. You know, because even I grew up in a way where it's like, you know everything's called socialism if you don't agree with it or communism sure and it's like you start thinking like why aren't we taking care of the elderly the way we should be why isn't there free health care for people why do people have to have why do women have to have babies out of the hospital because they can't afford to have it in the hospital we should sure. you know we should be taking care of these people like you know if you're sick we should take care of them and the younger generation, their ideals are not misguided, you know? And I like how they're not wavering either. You it's know, so. very nice to see. I mean, also, I, they don't have much of a choice in the way that we largely didn't. I mean, um, you having your house and me having mine is largely an, an anomaly with our age, age range. Like, anyone born... You know, I was born in 1985, and I guess you're technically Gen X or whatever, but you're like <laughs> on the 
on the cusp, you know, just yet. So they tell me, I'm, I'm just like, I'll go with it. <laughs> yeah, so whatever you say, sir or madam, me, you know, like, yeah, um, um, I'm not a boomer, so nobody said, okay, boomer, so I'm okay with that. Like, okay, thank you. <laughs> but just, um, how things are for us, like, the, like, the, it's very real that we may not be able to retire. Yeah. That's just the way that it might be for everyone moving forward. Um, and I guess just the reality of that, that like um, the American dream that everyone was t told was a thing hasn't really been able to be a thing since like 1955 or some shit, right? So um, what's the new one? How do we make a new American dream that fits for everybody and immigrants and people that aren't white? How do we make our new American dream? How? Let's figure it out. Watch Star Trek. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> you know, no money. You just pick the job you want to do, and that's what it is. Because, and it was funny because I was talking about, and we get in Star Trek all the time. And I was just like, I was like, well, how do you know they're going to be janitors? And he's like, because there are some people that want to be janitors and maintenance. Yeah. And those are the people who will do it. And if they don't have to worry about money and they're just doing their job and loving it, good for them. Like, or yeah, you, you would you would also think that maybe because it's far in the future, everything cleans itself at that point. So I love it. So everybody's just kind of doing whatever they want to do. I mean, even if they maybe they make maybe maybe they make those like uh, uh, like automated cleaning robots. You don't know. Don't don't judge. <laughs> but at the same time, too, like yeah. Y y you're going to have people all different walks of life who like doing all different things. And mm -hmm. we need to work towards that. Like I, I always tell people, I'm like, watch Star Trek. Well, it's socialism. If that's socialism, then sign me up. <laughs> it's like, cause it's nice and easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's nothing holding you back. So the geek in me is like, you know, I'm cool with that. <laughs> Star Trek is socialism. Yeah. Okay. Everything's socialism. You Everything's know socialism, but also like, it's not common, whatever. I don't want to get it, <laughs> but, but like, oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, I just, like, it's a whole other bag. Like, we have tons of shit that's already socialized, like the post office and the firemen and the police officers and the library and the garbage and your water and the sewer, if you have, and like all these things that you pay pay for in your taxes and things, thing, things of that nature. It's like that's socialized stuff. Anyway, sorry, I don't want to go on a rant. No, I get it. And it we're all <laughs> supposed to be interviewing you, but I'm having such a fun conversation. Yeah, <laughs> um, we, we get to we get to that point. But like, yeah, I want to let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, sure. You know, because we're coming towards the end, but I want to have some fun and I want to talk uh, some some stuff we love. Sure. Um, first and foremost, tell me your love of comic books. Where does it come from? Who's your favorite superheroes? Like, let's start there. Okay, so my love of comic books came from a pretty early age. I just kind of like, you know, like being how I grew grew up and stuff, um, I would like wander around a lot. And I rem remember I wandered into a local c c comic book store and I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, it was one of the coolest experiences that I think I've, I've had and will have ever. Just walking into a place with all this cool stuff and all these like games and comics and card games and everything that I was like, I think I'm interested in this, but I'm not sure. And then picking up the first thing I read ever was, was Batman. That was my first book. Um, it was Batman X, X-Men, Spider-Man. And then out of those three, I love Batman. Wolverine is one of my favorite dudes, so is Spider-Man, but my favorite is Venom. I love that man. I nice. love Venom. I love him because he is such a reluctant hero, and he goes through such a struggle just to do the right thing, and I feel like that is the crux of humanity, is that, like... Everyone's like, oh, I gotta do the right fucking thing. Fuck, let me figure out. Fuck. And then you just kind of like do it or don't. Yeah. You hope that people will and you hope that they do. And 
that's why I love Venom because of the struggle. You know, like most other heroes, it's like this is what I do, and then here's some mild conflict. Whereas with Venom, like it's like constantly like I want to eat humans' bodies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the the awesome part about that too is like he's always in an eternal struggle because there's two of them. Right, and they're always at odds with each other, which is great. Yeah. You know, so like yeah, he you know and. That's such a great character, and I mean, the fact that that is a character that was built by a fan, right? You know, being drawn by a fan, and then like they're like, "Yeah, let's do this." Tom McFarlane's like, "Fuck yeah!" And then, like, "Yeah, let's do this one." Um, I would say that overall, like, if I had to do an overall thing that I loved, <laughs> it was the Tick, which yes. was really cool because I was on the show, mm -hmm. so it was like a total, like, total fucking amazing so like i came up on the animated series mm -hmm. and being the weird outcast person that i was i didn't feel like i had a place in the world you know like 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 we've sp spoken about before and i remember i found the tick i watched the show i watched the animated series and for the first time i felt like i had a place in the world like everything was weird and everything was insane and absurd and ridiculous but everyone loved each other. Even the villains loved each other. There was an overwhelming feeling of love and hope, you know, from from the tick. And then after I watched the animated show, I then read all the comic books after that. Um, and then when I auditioned for the tick, I didn't even know I was auditioning for the tick. Um, it was under like a code code name. I don't remember what it was. But I walked into the room and I was with the c c c casting director and she was like, okay, this is the show. It's a tick. It's like a superhero show. It's pretty funny. And I was like, the, the tick, like the, the blue dude with the end. And then she was like, yeah, do you know it? And I was like, nope. No, I don't really know it that well. <laughs> um, and then I auditioned for my role and I walked out and I went and I went in the elevator and I just like started fucking weeping in the elevator so and i knew that like even if i didn't get this even if it wasn't in the show i got to audition for a thing that was so like personally connected to me um and my life yeah. and then i got it <laughs> and i was on it and i'm in like the whole thing and i got to meet ben edlund who created the the show and they tell you not to meet your heroes because they're not what they're supposed to be Ben Edlund lives up to every, he is incredible. Like he is such a beautiful human in general. Anyway, I'm speaking a lot. Do you have any questions or you want to ask? No, no, that's amazing. I love that. I love hearing yeah. those stories and that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did watch the animated series and I read the comic books. I have not had a chance to see you in the uh, new series yet, but it is on my list to watch. It's so a great now, show. Now it's, it's bumped up even more. To, but I saw that you're on it, so I was like, I was especially excited because I know they did it justice because I've read a lot about it. I just haven't had. They chance. did. I mean, they we did, and yeah, an incredible job with it, That's and amazing. we're all very very proud of it. And it got unfortunately canceled after two fucking seasons, and people still find it every day, and they message us and they tweet at us and they're like why is this gone and we're like we don't know <laughs> but yeah yeah but it's a it's awesome that you got to be on like your one of your favorite entities like you used to you got to play in that and that's just an awesome story man thank you for sharing that sure um sure. we were talking about the bird cage earlier something we do here on the show um is when we have somebody on i like to ask that's a remote dropper movie for me as i like to call it Okay. If it's on TV, I drop the remote. I'm watching the Birdcage. Oh sure, yeah. Um, what are your top five remote dropper movies? Okay, so it's the Birdcage, nice. Gladiator, mm. um, American History X. Oh, it's a tough one too. Yeah, love that. I love it. I love it. So any movie where, see, it's change. I'm fucking obsessed with change. Like I love it. What? So anyway, sorry. Um, no, no, so, no, no, no. It's great. I love it. So uh, what else did I just? Um, I will watch Waterboy if it's on nice. every time. Love that movie. 
Um, and uh, oh, what's it called? Oh, I just forgot the name of it. It's the Chris Farley movie with the auto parts. Is it B B Black Sheep? Oh, uh, Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy, yeah. So I'll watch that too. Yeah, that's a, that's another great one. Yeah, those are great choices. I never actually, I don't think anybody's ever chosen American History X or Tommy Boy before. So that Chris, does Chris Farley is one of my one of my like heroes too. Like I know that he had he had his own issues and he passed early, but he was an example of like he taught me that it was okay to be big and loud and energetic and extremely physical and to be just a just to be myself mm -hmm. Chris did and that was important to me and I know a lot of other people uh, and he yeah I mean he, he was in a weird way we're talking about normalization he normalized what it meant to it, comedy in a way like yeah you've always had like the big guys John Candy's John Belushi's and such uh they even Laurel and Hardy and Abbott Costello they had the big guys but and they're oafish, but like he normalized almost the weight to a point where it's like he could star in a movie by himself. Yeah. And yeah. and what was cool is that like he was the like oafish trope and he was funny and he did a lot of the crap where he got hit hit by things and he fell down. But especially in Tommy Boy, like especially with mm -hmm. all that shit with his father and trying to live up to expectations and him having to like learn and go through life and the way that specifically Chris Farley would be affected by something like like that like how he could go from this explosively loud large thing to this really in introspective quiet place of trying to figure it all out was really beautiful and really I'm I miss it <laughs> you know yeah Unfortunately, gone too too young because I feel like he could have offered so much more um, in terms of roles that that would again, like we were talking about, change and like kind of growing with a role and such. Like, imagine what he could have done. You know, when we talk about John, you know, I was talking about John Candy earlier, and he was another one for me being a big guy. Like, I gravitate towards that. You know, um, and you know, he did stuff he did roles that were just like, you know, I look back on him and I'm just like, you know, he's such a great actor, you know, the same with Chris Farley and, and, and such it was like being a big guy and being such a great actor that he was in not just comedies, but like action comedies. Yep. You know, and that's not what you saw. You didn't, that nobody was allowed to do that, you know? <clears throat> and, uh, and the only person that I've seen since, since him and thank, Christ, he is here. Is Jack Black? Is yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, and those are the guys who open the door for somebody like Jack mm -hmm. Black to be able to do that. Um, and it's it's just fantastic to see. And and Jack Black has, of course, taken the torch and and run away with it. I mean, he's done so many great things. Um, Tenacious D being one of them. I love Tenacious D. I love Tenacious. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, those are some great choices. Uh, Tommy Boy is definitely one that is an original nobody really says to that uh says to this question and it's true because it's such a great movie like even for me like yeah if it's on i'm watching tommy boy right like, it's that good um so thanks for that that you know fantastic but uh i do also want to ask like you know you talked about the birdcage but like um what are some of your favorite geek oriented movies like um let's say like sci-fi you know uh horror sunshine have you seen that with a? Uh... Uh, Killing Murphy. Oh yeah, it's a great movie. It's a great sci-fi. Um, I love Moon with um, nice. Uh, you know, Rock Moon. yeah, Sam Rockwell, yeah, yeah, with with Sam Sam Rockwell, who's incredible. Um, I just watched Battle for Los Angeles last night, which was great. Uh, which I totally forgot about. I think that's the name of it. Is the one with um Aaron Eckhart, where where yep. the aliens come for our water. Oh yeah, right. That yeah, that's that, been, that was great. Such a good movie too, and it's funny because remember that came out the same time as Skyline. Right. It's just those two like alien movies that came out at the same time, and Battle of Los Angeles didn't do as well. And now we see Skyline having like four more sequels, 
And I'm like, right. but Battle of Los Angeles could have been a very elongated franchise that you could have told and, and didn't have to just be Los Angeles. Like you could, could have, have went all over the world. Yeah. yeah. And it was more interesting. I mean, not, not that I didn't like, I liked Skyline. It's, I like the whole, like you're a high hybrid alien person and all that stuff is really cool. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, there's a lot of science fiction where it's like the aliens come in, like, like, like in like independence day or mm -hmm. like, a, 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 like a, a, a edge of tomorrow. And we just kind of like, we blow them up and we're like, woo, we did it. We're fucking, we did it. <laughs> Whereas, with Battle of Los Angeles, you could tell that like we were gonna take back LA, but the rest of the world was like a dumpster and we needed to go <laughs> like fix it. And the nuance of there was so much stuff like the the like nuanced like types of aliens that were there that were never explained. Like there there were the dudes with like the round heads that were the infantry guys, but then there were the tall ones that were like lieutenants or whatever i would love to learn more about what they were doing and like what the whole mm -hmm. like tier of peop of pe peoples are with that alien society there's just a lot of questions that i have about it yeah. um yeah and and like yeah th it, there was just so much more there's so many more elements and layers to that movie that just like they could have really touched down on i, I don't even know if it's a book series or not i i, I got to imagine it is usually they're based on either graphic novels or books. I might need to look into that a little bit more because going back and thinking about it now, I remember watching the movie and liking it a lot. I'd like to see it, what else is available from that universe if possible. But my all time favorite nerdy movie is um, Star Trek First Contact. Great movie. Great. I movie. love that movie. Love so it. Good. And it's just because the Borg as aspect, and if you watch Next Next Generation, and you have that like rich history of the Borg, and 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 with John John Luke, and to just having it come into this movie without any real like they didn't do any like heavy like handed like this is what what happened on the television program crap. They're just like here it is. It's part of the story. And it's fucking crazy, and like you just got it as like a fan of 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 all all that stuff. It was like, thank you for just making a movie that just uh, that just automatically assumed that you've seen it already, and now you get this amazing, incredibly rich fucking story. Yeah, and, that's a great choice, man. Uh, in every aspect of that too, you know. Just, just the, like a, nothing is taken away from it, like the Borg being a part of it, or the, you know, it, it's just. Ah, I love Star Trek. I can talk about that on Star like Trek it. and Star Wars, of course. You can say and talk about that all day long, but uh, yeah, I mean, and you're not supposed to like both, but I like I I, I love both. Yeah. So yeah. all day long, man. I, I'll watch. I, I'll you know, sa Saturdays can be a Star Wars marathon day, and then next day is Star Trek. Like, I don't care. Like, those are comfort movies for me. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, you know, and it's such different philosophies. Like, we even have on the scene stops now where, like, where all the shows do Star Trek week in September. Oh, cool. So, like, we'll interview people or we'll have panels and stuff like that, but it's just like, we're just celebrating this, you know? And then, of course, Star Wars during May. Um, sure. Because you know, it's, it's, you should celebrate these things. These are the things that, paved the way you know and now i see bullies from high school posting on facebook about like oh man the new star wars movie's coming out i'm like you used to beat the crap out of me for yeah, Star yeah, Wars. Like, you're a dick <laughs> <laughs> oh that, that, that's definitely <laughs> yeah but um i i do love that as parents like we're embracing for our kids especially like yeah be a geek have fun do it got it got it it should be so Josh, man, I had such a good time. This like, was usually, fun. Thank you for having me. I, yeah, usually interviews go like a half hour. I'm so happy. Like we are in such fun conversation. So like, yeah. I don't we mind. We talked about so much stuff. It was great. Got to have you back on the show, man. We have our normal live show on Tuesday, so you're always welcome if you want to come on and just uh, talk with us. And Whatever you want me, I will be there. 
All right, sweet. Well, I'm going to definitely reach out to you in the future, get you on the show. Um, but everybody, go check out. It's on the IFT network, correct? It is. Uh, it's yeah. after. Uh, are the eight are the eight episodes out all now? So everybody, can they check are out now, so you can binge the crap out of them. Um, they're I'm hearing some amazing things back, and that makes me feel so so happy. Nice. Um, haven't heard anything about making more. There's been some rumblings, but nothing official. Um, and I'm doing I'm doing a reading for some people of a new feature film. Called, called We Got What You Need, which is actually about comic books. So it's about um, this dude that works overnights at a gas station who is also an indie comic book writer. And it's about how he's trying to like change and move into a new part of his life, but he's extremely afraid. Um, and because he works overnights, he is kind of hallucinating all the time because he doesn't get enough sleep. And he, and, and he hallucinates in animation and 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 in comic book panels so like when he's really into it that's what's happening and everybody sees it and it also deals with like millennial life and not having any money and not being able to move on and it's also a dramedy so i hope and we have some really incredible actors coming in for the reading and i hope we get to make that soon <laughs> that would be awesome yeah i yeah. can't wait man i can't wait to check out after um thank you so much for coming on the show Sure, man. Uh, Thanks for having me so much. And hopefully we can get you back on soon. So everybody go check out Josh Hubart. Um, check out After on the IFT Network now. So available now. And let's get this other show made because it sounds really fun. And I love animation mixed in, you know, with, uh, you know, not real life, but like, uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, a live action. So that that will be just a, a awesome uh, thing to check out. Um, but yeah, so everybody, uh, as you know, I'm Nick Manhattan, uh, host of the Scene Stomps podcast. Uh, this is Scene Stomp Interviews. Uh, you can check us out over at thescenestomps.com, anywhere we're on any podcast platform, any and every, I should say. And you can go check out our YouTube channel. Go please subscribe and hit the notification bell. Uh, but until next time, Josh, thank you again. Thank you. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. And that's our show, everybody. Thanks for listening or watching wherever you're checking it out. Uh, this show is brought to you by our sponsor, Manscaped. Uh, go check them out. They are saving our balls and they can save yours too. Or somebody you care about. That's uh, a pretty awesome device. So go check out what they got. The Lawnmower 3.0, the Weed Whacker, and more. Uh, it's a great gift for Father's Day, birthdays, weddings, anything. Uh, so yeah, head over there and use promo code SNOBS, S-N-O-B-S, and you'll get 20% off and free shipping. Also, we'd like to thank our super fan patrons. Uh, they are all Scene Snob family to us. Uh, they support us every month, and you can be one too. So head over to the Patreon channel, uh, the Scene Snobs, and uh, you can, it's $5 a month, and you can join in with helping support us and get the free perks too. Uh, also, you can follow us on social media. We are on everything at the Scene Snobs, so Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok. Uh, we are on Facebook, The Scene Snobs, uh, everywhere. We have fun stuff always going on, always have contests and stuff, so go follow us, check us out. You can go to our link tree by going to thescenesnobs.com. There's our link tree, there's our patron, uh, there is our all of our shows and the links for all of that, so thanks again for checking it out. Just head over to thescenesnobs.com where everything is, and we will talk to you soon.